The long and difficult trip from his house to the store was something that Frank Dawson did frequently. His presence appeared to communicate his own unhappiness, so he had become used to the discomfort people felt around him. Living alone was the norm for Frank, a double amputee who relied on a wheelchair for mobility. Frank has been on his own for the past five years when his mother Charlotte died away, leaving him without any relatives to help out. Because his prostheses were so painful and uncomfortable, Frank would use his wheelchair to go to the store whenever he needed goods. But on this particular day, he had to put on his prosthetics and walk while his wheelchair was still being repaired. In spite of the challenges, Frank opted to take public transportation for a portion of the trip in order to alleviate some of the pressure. Frank understood his strategy might not work when he arrived at the bus stop during rush hour. His journey was made more difficult by the crowd, as many passers by cast critical glances in his direction. Some thought he was on the streets, making assumptions about his homelessness and the source of his handicap. Frank was aware that the worn out appearance of his clothing turned off some passers by as they waited for the bus. They would occasionally give the crippled man a dubious look. Others thought Frank was acting out his condition to get others to feel sorry for him or give him money. At long last, a bus pulled up, and passengers got on. Getting on the bus was a major struggle for Frank, but he was determined to find a comfortable seat. But then the bus driver glared at him and said, You're slowing everyone down. Hop off the bus and hail a different one. Homeless people are a nuisance because they drive away paying customers and I need to provide for my family. You should go get welfare. Frank stood there, tears streaming down his face, astounded by the driver's statements. People on the plane behind him were getting increasingly irritated by the holdup. Feeling ashamed, Frank grudgingly got off the bus and made his way to the closest bench to sit down and rest his sore knees, which were a result of his prosthetics. Particularly in light of Frank's history, the episode caused him great pain. His past as a fit, enthusiastic, and future-oriented Marine Corps sergeant was little known. After suffering severe wounds and losing both legs on a mission in the East, his life took a dramatic turn. Despite everything he had been through, Frank was ashamed of his military experience and rarely spoke about it or showed off his medals. Frank, like many others with disabilities, encountered enormous obstacles in civilian and military life. Dogged in his pursuit of independence, Frank politely denied assistance and made every effort to support himself. He realized that the agony he had endured as a result of his injuries had a direct correlation to his mother's untimely demise. While seated on the bench, Frank cast longing glances at passers-by, but no one halted to ask how he was doing. Frank was so disheartened by the bus event that he stopped eating and vowed never to return to the establishment. As he was mentally getting ready to go home, he felt someone's intense gaze fixate on him. He glanced up and noticed a cab driver standing by his vehicle. Watching him closely, why is he gawking at me like I'm an exhibit? As apprehensive thoughts raced through Frank's mind, inquiring, Excuse me, may I be of service to you? The stranger stepped forward. At first, Frank was hesitant because he didn't want to be taken advantage of. But then he thought of his tired legs and changed his mind. You look like you might need some assistance. Just hop in. I'll drive you anywhere you need to go, the driver said. Frank finally accepted the offer after giving some thought to his sense of self-reliance and pride. Max, the young man, was born to parents who emigrated from a war-torn nation, and he spent his childhood in America. He promised Frank that the ride would not cost anything and turned off the meter. Max said, put away your money, sir, in response to Frank's effort to purchase his services. I will be paid in full because I have already achieved my daily quota. Feeling touched by Max's compassion and understanding, Frank settled into the taxi, relieved and thankful for the unexpected kindness. Frank had a suspicion, though, that the driver was not telling the whole truth and probably didn't have any further passengers booked. Max promised to pick up Frank's wheelchair as soon as he found out it was being fixed. It's not at all difficult. I have a big vehicle. We'll take it up and go on, Max declared with assurance. Frank was moved to tears by Max's generosity and kindness. Feeling as though he had met a saint sent from heaven, other than his mother, 
no one had showed him such love and care since he became crippled. Luckily, the repairs were complete, and Max drove to Frank's residence to retrieve the wheelchair. They started talking and showed real interest in each other's life during the ride. Even though they were not the same age, Frank could identify with Max's struggles. Max talked about his family, his demanding profession as a cab driver, and his mother's severe condition, which necessitated expensive surgery. My wife is expecting twins, and I don't have that kind of money. I work 16 or even 18 hours a day because of this, Max said. Frank had a great deal of sympathy for the youth. For the last 30 minutes, Max had been giving Frank free rides despite his financial difficulties. Frank blushed with embarrassment and said nothing more. Motivated by Max's situation, the former Marine came up with a scheme. Few people were aware that Frank had been saving for a new electric wheelchair for 10 years. Hoping to use it to enjoy things like feeding ducks at the lake and move around the city. Frank made a tough choice when they got closer to his home and begged Max to hold off for a short while. He limped on crutches as fast as he could towards his home. Naturally, it took him longer than a few minutes to come back. A large envelope was in his hands. Please take this. Frank stumbled over his words and mumbled. It's for you and your family. Max's face froze in genuine awe at what he saw within. Frank had been saving money for ten hard years. And that's what was in the envelope. The driver firmly said, Sir, I'm sorry, but I can't accept this money, attempting to give Frank back the envelope. The former Marine was insistent. Though, time was precious, in his opinion, and the money could be better used to help others in greater need. Frank had to work hard to persuade to take the money. The cab driver always depended on himself and wasn't used to getting presents. The last thing on mind when he offered to assist Frank was thinking about getting anything in return. The ex-marine and the cab driver had an embrace that lasted for a few minutes. Max had the impression that he was living out a dream in a fairy tale. He had put in a lot of overtime and saved every penny to support his ailing mother. Max, please take care of your parents, Frank remarked kindly. The cab driver thanked him and said he will be back shortly. Smiling. Frank watched the taxi fade into the distance as he made his way home. He was aware that his good deed will eventually pay off. Frank walked up to his ancient refrigerator and took an envelope out of the door. $20,000, the whole amount he had amassed over a 10-year period, had originally been contained in the old envelope. He put a fresh envelope in its place, carefully labeling it, $1. After becoming close friends, Frank and Max's family began spending weekends with Frank, who they were always appreciative of for his assistance. Max remained Frank's devoted companion, helping him with daily chores and errands, even though the former Marine was never able to afford an electric wheelchair. He did get something far more precious, a true buddy who would have been invaluable regardless of the cost. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. Even after six months on the job, April was still having trouble understanding the complex regulations of the restaurant. The work itself appeared simple, taking orders and serving customers, but the unspoken regulations established by manager Connor Douglas made things more challenging in the restaurant, tipping the wait staff, dividing the doorman's commission, and adhering to Mr. Douglas's stringent kitchen procurement standards were all part of these unofficial guidelines. April opted to blend in and comply like her colleagues instead than challenging the system, even though it was effectively benefiting the management. In addition to her profession, April attended a nearby institution with the intention of becoming a Chinese translator. She did this out of sheer desperation to help her sick mother. April's mother shied away from broaching the subject of her father's absence from her life. April chose not to probe her mother any further at this difficult time, even though she had suspicions about her mother's secrets. Cleaning at a wayside motel was a tough job for Natalie Dawson, who already had health problems due to her exposure to water and chemicals, regardless of her health problems. Natalie maintained her unwavering will to see her daughter succeed. She was adamant that April attend college, where her aptitude for languages, especially Chinese, really blossomed, 
the mystique and intrigue of Chinese culture, with its distinctive allure and ancient writing system, drew April mysteriously, she was captivated by the subject, but her position at the restaurant didn't allow her to use her language talents, instead, she had to rely on her mother's gift of beauty, while serving one day. April saw a table adjacent where some energetic youths had been having fun not long earlier, one man was left now, maybe exhausted or inebriated, sleeping with his hand propped up as a cushion, promptly seeing and calling over to April, the vigilant manager, who was intent on preserving order, inquired about the matter, at first, April didn't understand, but she eventually figured out that the man had probably been partying with his companions when they abandoned him, in irritation. Connor scowled, have him leave this place, he demanded, my consumers will be scared away by him, to get him where he needs to go, just hail a cab, April was aware that arguing with the management would be pointless and expensive, despite her discomfort with the assignment, she got out of her work clothes and went to wake up the man because her shift was about to end. She solicited the aid of the doorman to lead the severely drunk man to the waiting taxi outside when shaking his shoulder failed, April, worried about his safety, opted to bring him to her house instead of leaving him on the street, she couldn't let him go, even though she knew her mother would disapprove of her unexpected guest, after April felt she had no choice, she returned home from the restaurant with the man who was barely conscious. Natalie Dawson was so shocked to see him that she almost passed out, so, what's the deal, you found this man, she shouted, April said, he's not homeless, mom, although her voice trailed off anguish, he is a patron of the eatery, I brought him here because he was sick, despite her evident unease, Mrs. Dawson understood April's intentions and refrained from punishing her daughter, with the hope that he would get well soon. She assisted April in carrying the man to the guest room and placed him on the couch, she smiled anyway, attempting to soothe April, even though she was worried, the following morning, April rose before the sun, and the man, who was now conscious but still disoriented, attempted to make sense of his environment, an embarrassed I'm sorry escaped his lips, no, I don't drink and drive, a month ago, my fiancé and I broke up, and yesterday, I had a few too many drinks. It broke my heart that it occurred, with a comforting grin, April said, don't worry about it, although I didn't think so yesterday, nothing negative happened, the man asked to be called Sam and identified himself as Sam Green, which diffused the situation, they discovered over breakfast that Sam, who maintained his modesty and groundedness, was the owner of multiple construction enterprises that he inherited from his late father. April and her mother were impressed by his intelligence and politeness, they had been surprised by his change in behavior the night before, before making his way out, Sam expressed his gratitude to April and her mother for their hospitality, though he wished he could have stayed longer, Sam chose not to overstay his welcome, leaving April with a melancholy look as he drove off, she quickly got ready for work and realized that, in spite of the unanticipated turn of events, most things in her life had not changed, there was no reason to mess with her regular morning routine at the eatery, everyone was talking about what happened with the inebriated customer last night, where did April take him, I wonder, the dishwasher said, did she rent a room in a motel or something? No, I don't believe that, April would need money, but where would she obtain it, the doorman disagreed, saying, her mother is unwell too, and there weren't many tips yesterday, Everyone in the restaurant fell silent, as if anticipating April's arrival, and pretended to be preoccupied in the kitchen, April could still feel her co-workers' eyes on her, though, as they all tried to figure out what had transpired after the cafe closed, however, April didn't want to disseminate rumors and embarrass the young businessman whose infraction wasn't as serious as it initially appeared, Sam did, after all, act quietly and without causing any commotion, everyone makes errors from time to time, what mattered most was that he learned from them, and everything else was just incidental, a month passed so quickly, Connor Douglas persisted in abusing his staff with startling regularity and persistence while holding the manager role. When April attempted to protest one day because she could take no more of his exploitation, she was dismissed right away, after serving this table, 
please leave the area. I want you to never come back to my restaurant, Connor declared, gesturing to an adjacent table. April had to serve the four young individuals seated at the table in business suits, even though it broke her heart, they were speaking mostly in Chinese, and three of them had a distinctly Eastern aspect. Regarding the individual seated at the fourth table, April recognized his features just somewhat. When she looked more closely, she gasped, it's Sam, the same businessman who spent the night at my place when he got too drunk to get home. The young man held a copy of a partnership agreement from the investor's company in his hands. Although it was printed in Chinese, an English translation was conveniently attached. Sam could read the agreement, but when the folks seated across from him talked, he was not able to understand them. Moreover, the Chinese investors were acting rashly and provocatively because they believed they were better than everyone else. It transpired that Sam's business interpreter was ill with a high fever on that fateful day, leaving him unable to translate for the partners. Sam had the impression that he was stranded in a terrible film, put in an embarrassing predicament at the director's whim. The men were at a loss for what to do as they searched for a way out of this situation. Sam waved his hand relieved to see April. Upon hearing brief excerpts of the conversation, the waitress became aware that the Chinese investors were talking about an unusual topic. Even worse, they had the exact opposite goal in mind for Sam. To force him to sign a terrible deal in order to lose all of his money, April shuddered at the knowledge. She had not anticipated hearing anything like that. While this was going on, the Chinese investors who were unaware of the situation were delightedly conversing in their mother tongue, certain that no one could understand what they were saying. April, on the other hand, not only comprehended them, but she also immediately became aware of the potential threat that their plan posed to Sam in the future. It was at that precise moment that April had a thought that was quite intriguing, despite the fact that she was still holding the platter. She approached the investors and talked in Chinese that was completely fluent. You're deceiving Sam. The Chinese visitors suddenly grew obviously anxious, exchanged meaningful glances with one another, and stood up from the table without any further explanation. What is it? Will you be going somewhere? What exactly is going on? Sam exclaimed in a state of exasperation. April, on the other hand, put her hand on his shoulder and smiled at the Chinese guests wishing them a happy day in their native tongue. It wasn't until a short while later that Sam could comprehend what had actually taken place. A grateful expression appeared on the face of the young waitress as the businessman took in the information on the fraudulent scheme that the investors had devised. You are so appreciative. If you hadn't been there for me, I would have collapsed into bankruptcy. That transaction is of utmost significance, and I could not allow it to go out of business. With a grin on her face, April shook her head, to tell you the truth, she did not experience any trace of awkwardness. The fact that April was able to translate Chinese spoken by native speakers was a source of great satisfaction for her. She had spent years learning Chinese. In response to Connor Douglas's discovery of the situation, Sam extended an offer to her to work for his company as a translator, which was an exceptionally generous gesture. His eyes were filled with jealousy when he returned to his office after looking at the newly assigned translator. Following the event that took place at the restaurant, April and Sam had developed a friendship that was both pleasant and trustworthy through their interactions. After about a month had passed, they had already begun a passionate relationship that was in no way comparable to the relationship between a superior and an employee. The young couple had a strong affection for one another and had every intention of getting married. Natalie Dawson was overjoyed by this turn of events since it brought her desire of a better life for her daughter even closer to becoming a reality in the most extraordinary way. As a present for April's wedding, Sam purchased the restaurant where she had previously worked as a waitress. April had worked there in the past. In the process of becoming the new owner of the business, April terminated Connor Douglas' employment. So denying him the chance to financially benefit from the efforts of another individual, in the present day, the restaurant exudes an environment that is both tranquil and cozy, and its patrons are unable to get enough of April's inventions, which have transformed the establishment into a genuine paradise. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts, 
Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.